Some things in our lives are so common, we take them for granted, without giving much thought to their purpose or really even to their existence. Take, for example, doors. We have doors on our cars. We have doors in our houses. Both outside doors, we have doors in the interior rooms. We have doors in our cabinets. We have all kinds of doors. They come in all shapes and sizes. Some are decorated. Some are very plain. I want you to try for a moment to imagine life without doors. Imagine driving down the highway without doors on your car. Now some of you say, well, I remember the old Jeeps. They didn't have doors, and that's true. I, I could not imagine flying down a interstate at 70 miles an hour in a vehicle that did not have doors. You don't know what might fly up into your car, and you certainly wouldn't want to fall out of your car. I, I do have one experience with that. <clears throat> when I was about what, three, three years old, my family had a, an old Volkswagen bus. Remember, remember those? Had the back hatch door. Well, I loved to climb all the way into the back, and I would sit with my back against that hatch door. And one day, my mom pulls up to a stop sign, and for whatever reason, that hatch opened. And the way my mom tells it, she looked in the rearview mirror and just saw two feet going out. So she put the car in park and ran around the back, probably thinking it'd be blood all over the place. Um, I didn't land on my head, thankfully. Uh, about the only thing that happened was a shoe came off. I was real upset about that. <clears throat> but fortunately, that was all that happened. Uh, but life without doors can be kind of scary. Think about the doors of your home. If you didn't have doors in your house, the weather could come in. The elements, the cold air of winter, the hot air of summer, rain, wind. You could have all kinds of unwelcome guests, two-legged and four-legged variety. Just come right in. Imagine your interior house uh, without doors. You'd have no privacy anywhere. Life without doors in a word would be insecure. You know, if your refrigerator or freezer didn't have a door, it couldn't keep anything cold. If your oven didn't have a door, it couldn't keep anything hot. We really rely on doors, even though we don't give them a whole lot of thought. When our series of messages, Jesus in the present tense, we're studying the I am statements of Jesus, we come to a statement that's used twice in our text today, which is John chapter 10. Uh, now, as you're turning there, I want to point out two challenges that we have in this text. Uh, the first is with the saying itself. Depending on what translation of the Bible you have, uh, it may read that Jesus said, I am the gate, others, I am the door. So which is it? And in studying it, looking into the original language, uh, most scholars agree that the Greek word here Jesus uses is the word for door. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the door of the sheep. And so that's the word that we're going to use here. There's not a whole lot of difference between gate and door. It's just that's the closest uh, equivalent to the original language. Uh, the Bible I normally use is the New International Version, and they use gate. So this morning, I'm going to preach out of the English Standard Version, uh, which uses the word door. So if there is a little bit of uh, discrepancy between the translations, understand uh, that's where it comes from. The second challenge is within this text itself. Jesus speaks of himself as the door for the sheep and also the shepherd of the sheep. Next week, we're going to look into his statement, I am the good shepherd. But the imagery is mixed through this 10th chapter of John. And it's not always easy to distinguish. He says, I am the door 
and the shepherd comes in through the door. Well, you're also the shepherd. How can you be the shepherd and the door? We have trouble keeping that straight. People in the Middle East in the first century did not. Uh, this, this was actually quite common. Jesus said, I am the living bread. I'm the bread of life. And he also said, I give the bread of life. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. And then he says, I am the truth. So these things might uh, cause us a little uh, mental irregularity, but um, it, it was something they understood at that time. Now, this imagery of, of a shepherd and sheep is one of the most common ones found in the Bible. Old and New Testament, you see a lot of references to God being the shepherd and his people being the sheep of his pasture. Probably the most famous verse in the Old Testament, Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. And that whole psalm talks about uh, the care that God gives to his people comparing it to a shepherd and his flock. Uh, you see this again, Old and New Testament. This, this idea is also applied to the church in several places in the New Testament. Spiritual leaders are called pastors. A pastor is actually a Latin word, meaning shepherd. If you ever had uh, a Spanish, I took one year of it. Don't remember. I think the only thing I remember from Spanish class is no hablo espanol, which means I don't speak Spanish. Uh, so if I ever get in trouble, I can use that. But I do remember I went to a Christian school part of that year, and we learned the 23rd Psalm in Spanish. And I remember that the Spanish word for shepherd is pastor. And it comes from this same, uh, the same Latin word. So even within the church, we, we have this concept of shepherds. So we come to John chapter 10, and again, I, I, I know it's been read earlier, but I'd like to read through it in its entirety, and then we'll look at what it meant when Jesus said it originally, and then how it applies to us today. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but cl climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls out his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, and the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life, and that they might have it abundantly. So here we see Jesus saying, I am the door. He's utilizing that name of God, I am, claiming divinity. And he says specifically, I am the door. Now doors are used in two ways. You enter through the door, and you exit through the door. And we're going to see both in the application today. We enter the door for admission. We enter the door for asylum. And we exit the door for access. Now before we look at these three truths, I, I do want to point out something in verse 6. Some translations use the word parable. Jesus used this parable with them. The English Standard Version says the figure of speech. Uh, technically, this is not a parable. In fact, the Greek word is not parabole, which is what is usually translated parable. It is a different Greek word. It is a figure of speech. It, it's really, uh, the original is more close to a proverb 
this is a bit of an extended proverb. Proverbs are usually very short, uh, but but that's the idea here. It, it's um, it, it's a phrase that Jesus uses uh, that is a bit of a cryptic saying. There, there's it's a loaded statement, we might say. There's more to it than initially meets the eye. And John is very clear here that people didn't get it. They didn't understand, and so Jesus had to go on and amplify what he was saying. Uh, it's, it's a bit of uh, the, a verbal equivalent of one of Jesus' signs. And it didn't, wasn't just a matter of of understanding, it revealed spiritual truth to those who believed in him, but it concealed that truth from those who rejected him. And it was a way of, uh, in essence, winnowing out the chaff from the wheat, the, the true followers of Jesus from those who were just along for a ride. So let's take a look at what this meant in Jesus' own time what it means to us today. First of all, we enter the door for admission. He says, I am the door for the sheep. Now, early in the passage, he says that through the door, the shepherd comes in. And one thing we'll talk about more next week when we get into the good shepherd. Shepherds lead their sheep. They don't drive them. You drive cattle. You lead sheep. And so the shepherd would go in through the door and the sheep follow. But Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way we enter for admission. It's a bit like another uh, figure of speech Jesus used back in John 1.51 where he compares himself to a ladder connecting heaven and earth. In John 14, a passage we'll look at in a couple of weeks, He says, I am the way. You say, the way to what? Well, at the end of the verse, he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way to salvation. And in fact, in this passage, in the original language, through me is in an emphatic position. As if Jesus is saying, through me and only through me can you enter in. Through me and only through me can you have entrance into the presence of God. Now, he doesn't use the analogy here, but we see this in the temple of the Jews. When it was built, there was an inner room called the Holy of Holies. That was where the Ark of the Covenant sat. That was where the presence of God was revealed Now, of course, God is everywhere, but he revealed his presence in that little area. Now, they did not have a door going into the Holy of Holies. Rather, they had a curtain, a very thick curtain that kept people out of the presence of God. Because a person whose sin had not been atoned goes into the presence of God, they'd be struck dead immediately. Well, God had arranged so that once a year, one person, the high priest, would be allowed into the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrificial lamb. And he could make atonement for the people. But that was the only time anybody was allowed into the presence of God. And only one person could do it. But do you remember what happened when Jesus died on the cross? That curtain was torn from top to bottom and it opened the way of access to God. The author of Hebrews picks up on this and he speaks of Christ's body as the rent veil, the torn curtain. And now we can go boldly to the throne of grace to find mercy in our time of need. We have access to to God through Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the only way. It is through Him that sinners can approach the Father and appropriate the salvation He provides. 
Only Jesus is the true source of knowledge of God and of salvation. Only he is the basis for our spiritual security. And there is only one door. If that one door people do not enter, they stay outside. Now you look around here, and uh, a fire marshal would probably be pleased to see that there are more than one door out. You want multiple exits in case of a fire or something of that nature. But when it comes to the presence of God, there is only one door, and it is marked Jesus. I am the door. We cannot demand another door. There is no other way in. Secondly, we enter the door for asylum. Now, I'll admit, in my younger years, I only associated the word asylum was the place you put insane people, right? That was the only thing I knew that word to mean. But in fact, especially in more recent times, the term is better known as a sanctuary or shelter. You think of people that live in a nation where they're being oppressed and they seek asylum in another country. They are looking for entrance so that they would be safe. That they would be secure. That's the way we're using this term today. Jesus portrays himself as the door that would safeguard the sheep. Now, shepherds in first century Judea mostly tended sheep for their wool. There were some sheep that were intended for consumption. Uh, there were even some sheep that were intended uh, specifically for sacrifices at the temple. It's likely the shepherds of the Christmas story were tending those kinds of sheep there in Bethlehem. But most of the sheep that were raised in first century Judea were for its wool. And as the animals grazed, they grew these thick mats of fleece that were sheared off and then sold for a significant profit. Naturally, the larger a shepherd's flock, the more profit you make. And so it was in their best interest to guard the sheep. Now, one thing about sheep, they have absolutely no defensive mechanisms whatsoever. Sheep are not very fast. They're not going to outrun a predator. They have absolutely nothing to fight with. And to be quite honest, they're not the smartest animals on the block. They get lost easily. They frighten easily. They just basically sit there and go, Bleh. and that's about all they can do in the face of danger. They need protection. They need security. Now, oftentimes you would have uh, within a sheep fold, it was an enclosure uh, made of rocks that was, the walls were tall enough the sheep couldn't jump over, which didn't have to be all that tall. And it would have one opening that the sheep could go in and out. Now that opening generally did not have a gate. It was just open. But at night, the shepherd would lay in that passageway, in that opening. He would position himself so that the sheep could not get out. He was also positioning himself so that nothing else could get in. No predators, no thieves. He was the door. And for a sheep to get out at night, which is not a good idea, he'd have to go through the shepherd. For a predator to come in and do damage, he'd have to go through the shepherd. He was the door, the security. And in doing so, the shepherd risked his own life. I'm sure he probably lost a lot of sleep. I don't imagine that was a very comfortable position to be in. And he was always have to be aware of what was going on around him. But that's what he did for the sheep. Later in this very same chapter, down in verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. None can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What is Jesus saying here? I am the protection for the sheep. I am their security. And no one can take them out of my hand. Paul would later write in Romans chapter 8, For I am convinced that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither height nor depth, Anything in God's creation can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's what Jesus is saying here. You are safe in the hands of Jesus. Commercials will tell you that you're in good hands with Allstate. You're in better hands with Jesus. And the premiums have all been paid. No one can take us out of God's hands, we are safe. We enter the door for asylum, for safety and security. And then finally, we exit the door for access. Doors not only let us in, they also let us out. And here the image is not that of the door as a barrier for protection, but as a passageway to go out of the sheepfold. In Jesus' metaphor, he is the door through which the sheep enter the safety of God's fold and then go out to the rich pasture of his blessing. You'll notice he uses the words to go in and go out. Very, very common uh, thought in the Old Testament. Occasionally it was used about an army, that they would go in and out of battle. And the idea is they were going to come home. There was a sense of, of certainty and security in that. But more often than not, where you see this phrase, it's used in just the ordinary affairs of life. David wrote in Psalm 139, You know my rising up and my lying down. You know my going in and my going out. Just every day, what we might think are mundane details of our lives, God knows. And God is involved. And God says, I want you to enjoy the rich pastures of being my people. This is what it means to have an abundant life. The rich pastures of the Lord. His sheep enjoy fullness and freedom. See, Jesus not only gave his life for us, but he gives his life to us. And that's not just when we die and go off to be in heaven. That begins now. Jesus has come to bring abundant life. Now here we've got to be careful. Because we've had some, particularly in what's called the word faith movement. This is a, a lot, not all. A lot of the preachers are on TV. Preach what you might call the prosperity gospel. You know, Jesus came to give you life abundantly, and that means a fat wallet a sleek new car, anything you want, you can name it and claim it, and God has to give it to you. Kind of like God is a genie in the bottle, and you, know, you rub the lamp. Instead of saying abracadabra, you say, in Jesus' name. And God appears and says, your wish is my command. And we tell God what he's going to do for us. That is so foreign to what the Bible teaches. It should not even be used in the context of Christianity. That is not what the abundant life is. In fact, Jesus promised pretty much the opposite. <laughs> In Luke chapter 9, verses 22 through 25, he says, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For anyone who wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What good is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? What good is that? See, Jesus is not offering material wealth. No stack of shekels. No pension. No insurance coverage. Not even a guarantee of safety. We have become so consumed in our culture with safety. You've got to play it safe. got to play it safe. You know, I don't find that in Scripture. Now, I'm, say, I'm not saying we should be foolish. But... 
What about the, the servant that was given the talent and he wanted to be safe and so he went out and buried it in his backyard and then when the, the master came in, he said, well, here's your, here's your talent, safe and sound. The master wasn't real pleased. God doesn't promise us safety in this life from every possible calamity there is. There's something more important. It's living life that's meaningful. Living life that has purpose. Having peace and joy regardless of the circumstances. Living each day to the glory of God. Not trying to preserve ourselves. Jesus has come that we might have life. That we might have it abundantly. He gives us a spiritual abundance. Love that you'll never experience anywhere else. Peace that passes understanding. Joy in the face of adversity. Patience. Self-control. These are the kinds of things God offers. And this is what the abundant life is. Now I realize that really flies in the face of what most people think of Christianity. You know, most people outside the church, quite honestly a few people inside the church, you know, they characterize Christianity as boring. It's kind of like that what your doctor says about a diet, if it looks good and tastes good, you can't have it. And people think of that of the Christian life. If it feels good, if it's fun, if it makes you happy, don't do it. That God is sitting in heaven with his arms crossed over his chest with a scowl on his face, just trying to look to see if anybody dares having fun. Got to stop that. Where do you find that in the scripture? It's not there. That is not the God we serve. We have life. Life to the full. Not just when this life ends. It begins now. A life marked by peace and purpose. A, a genuine purpose for living. Joy transcends our circumstances. Could you imagine if people today could live without fear? And yet that's the kind of life Jesus offers. Someone has counted, there's 365 references in the Bible that say, do not fear. Do not be afraid. One for every day of the calendar. We are not to live in fear as believers. What do we have to fear? The Lord is our shepherd. Jesus provides us with life. Those who trust in him enter the Lord's flock and fold. And they have a wonderful privilege of going in and out and finding pasture. In fact, the Greek word there is plural, pastures. As you go to the same pasture all the time, eventually there's nothing there left. You've got to move on to something else. But he guides us into his pastures. The sheep that enter the fold through Christ go in and out and they have all their needs met. Jesus said, I am the door. As his sheep, we go in, we go out through him. We enter the door for admission. Jesus is the only way to become part of God's flock. He also provides admission to the presence of the Father through prayer. Through Him we go boldly to the throne of grace. We also enter the door for asylum, for protection from our enemies. We're in great hands when we're in God's hands. And then we exit the door for access to the green pastures of abundant life. And that life begins here on earth. See, doors provide security in a variety of ways in our lives. 
And Jesus said, I am the door. I am the only door. And he provides the utmost insecurity for this life and for the next. 